And we're going to start, though Paul's going to get here in just a minute, with Damon. And I'm going to hand it over uh, to Damon right now with a couple of questions. So Damon, uh, thank you for being here. This is really <laughs> no a treat for us. And so for the people that don't know you, can you please just give us a little background on your story? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so good morning, everyone. My name is Damon Cox. I uh, am a VP of uh, Next Practice and Inclusive Growth at Mass Challenge. Mass Challenge is a global accelerator. Um, and we work with startups all over the globe. Um, we are based here in Boston, but we also do work in Texas, uh, Rhode Island, and we have locations in Mexico, Switzerland, Israel, and all over the world. We do work in, 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 in other locations as well. Um, and essentially, we're a global accelerator that help uh, startups, and we work with startups. We have a vast uh, mentorship network and network of professionals uh, that we connect those entrepreneurs uh, with and plug them into and um, we help them build their uh, enterprises and so um, we uh, we welcome you all to, to look us up and to uh, apply for our program we run an early stage program a six-month program um, that is sector agnostic and um, uh, we have been doing that for the last 12 years so uh, welcome anyone and everyone to uh, learn more about mass challenge and um, thankfully we have the man of the hour here Paul English. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Good, good day. Good to I, see you. I know how Boston traffic can be. So uh, I, I, thankfully, you successfully navigated that. So so thanks so much. Um, I was just uh, introducing myself, but uh, would love to introduce you. I know that um, we are very fortunate to have uh, Paul here. I know that uh, time is a precious commodity. So thank you all for joining us. Um, and I know, uh, Paul, it's a precious commodity for you as well. So thank you for joining us and thank you for sharing um, uh, some of your uh, professional um, knowledge and uh, sharing your experience with us. So, sure. Let me do a brief intro. Yeah, could you? Yeah, I'll do, a six, I'll do a 60 second bio here. You can time me. Uh, I'm a software engineer. I've started and sold six companies. I'm best known for kayak.com, but I also have done security software, customer service, e commerce consumer travel, business travel, and podcasting. I'm now running a venture studio called Boston Venture Studio. Our website is bvs.net. We're launching three companies in the next three months. Um, in addition to that, I've started four nonprofits uh, and I'm working on my fifth right now. One of my nonprofits is called Embrace Boston. It's a, um, a nonprofit working on racial justice based on the work of Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King. And we actually have a memorial we just built this year, which is down the street. Hopefully, you guys will check it out on the Boston Common. That's amazing. Uh, so you're doing so much. Let's dive into it. Where do the ideas come from, Paul? Yeah, so unlike an accelerator or an incubator where you the accelerator incubator helps other people with their ideas, a venture studio is a little bit more arrogant, and I apologize for that. We only work on our own ideas. We have a core team of six that are based in Boston and New York, and then we have... Um, engineers, some just outside of Boston and some in Pakistan. And I think we have about 40 engineers. Wow. But we have um, like 10 concepts under development right now, which will probably turn into three companies. Wow. And so those concepts come from that team or from outside of that team? Or yeah, they're, they're largely for me. I mean, I, um, I'm very ADD and I'm always excited about the shiny new object. Yeah. I probably have an idea a week for a new company. Yeah. And so once a week, I'll write out a plan. Um, do some research. I'm really also into branding and naming. Mm -hmm. So I own 500 domain names and um, sometimes I'll pay a lot of money for a domain name. If it's just a name, I just like want it, yeah. I'll, I'll buy it. And so all our products have really good names and good domain names. And we do a lot of visual design and brand identity work. So we want to make sure we're, all we do is consumer tech, okay. but we want to make sure that, um, you know, just it looks good, yeah. sounds good, and then try to build products which are incredibly yeah. simple and fast. So it sounds like you have your hands in all the work. The ideas mainly come from you. How do you stress test those ideas, and who ch who keeps you in check? Because you're the boss. Yeah, so a couple of things. Yeah, we have we have a few people on the team that are helping with competitive analysis, market research, uh, user interviews, which I've done at all my prior companies. My um, advice to anyone here thinking just about starting a company: probably everyone in this room has five ideas you're excited about, and you think about which of these five ideas should I work on? Or which idea is hot enough that I should quit my day job and just focus on one idea full time? I think the first litmus test, which either thinking about wherever you're working on now, starting a company, or even in a venture studio, 
is you pitch the idea to the best people you know, like the strongest, strongest, not more smartest people. And if you can get someone to say, whoa, I like that. And they say they want to help and they help you without you paying them. And they help you just sort of with promise of equity. And sometimes just on a handshake, you don't even talk about the details yet because it is too early. Um, getting really talented people to work with you is the first litmus test. If you can't get really talented people to work with you for free, um, I, not always for free, but the, the, the volunteer to work with you, it's one of two things. Either the problem you think you're trying to fix isn't big enough, or you're not compelling enough a storyteller. Um, storytelling is probably the most important skill that we have to develop as entrepreneurs. Luckily, it's a skill that can be improved. I'm a big fan of improv comedy. How many people here have been to an improv comedy class? Yeah, I'm a big fan. I think everyone should do that. Um, it teaches you how to riff and co collaborate. And storytelling begins with, for a company, what type of culture you're trying to build. And if I was trying to recruit you to work with a new company, I would describe the culture I'm trying to build and say, I want you to help me build a company that is known for X, Y, and Z. Get you excited about that. And then try to get you excited about the problem yeah. as well. So this is really interesting. Let's go back just a little bit um, and talk about, so you're from West Roxbury, yeah. right? Which is not far from here. Yeah. My kids go to school in West Roxbury, yeah. so I know the area very well. Uh, you started a company and you s built the company here. You stayed here. Um, how important was that for you to, to build your business here in Boston and keep it here in Boston? Yeah. I think you can almost build a tech company these days anywhere. COVID has taught us that remote works. Mm -hmm. And I know there are people like Musk who want people to return to office. And there are some advantages of being in an office. But a lot of people like the flexibility of not the commute I did this morning. Uh, and they like the flexibility of being able to get some coffee and setting up with their big screens and, you know, in a comfortable environment. Um, because of that, I think you can almost work anywhere. The reason I'm in Boston is, is very simple, just for family reasons. I'm one of seven. I have two children, who are both adults, but I'm very, very close to my siblings. I've been cooking dinner for them every Tuesday for the last 15 years. Oh, wow. And uh, that's why my roots are in Boston. I, mean, I grew up here, went to high school, went to college here, uh, but it's really family that's keeping me here. And Boston is a great city for tech. There's so many resources like, like Mass Challenge and the network that comes out of Mass Challenge. Uh, it's just very useful for anyone doing entrepreneurship in the city. Right. And a lot of talent here, I'm assuming. Yeah. The great universities. Right. Uh, but, but as far as building an actual enterprise, do you find that, you know, the, there, are there regulatory issues that you have to deal with on a regular basis or um, how, how is that building a business here? No, regulatory. It's often been said that if you're not breaking regulations, you're not being daring enough. And yeah. you look at the great companies created in the last 10 years, you know, Uber, Airbnb, um, you can go on and on the list. Each one of them started out by breaking a regulation because the industry evolves to work a certain way. And it takes an entrepreneur to look at the problem and say, there's a different way to do this. And maybe by doing it a different way, it breaks the rules slightly. And you have to take some risks and bump into some things. But eventually, if you can create a product that consumers like or businesses like, uh, the regulations will follow. Because if you can demonstrate that your product is adding value and helping people and providing service at a low cost, mm -hmm. usually you'll find a way to, to get it to work. Gotcha. Great. So maybe you can share with us your journey of starting your very first company. How did you start it and how did it end? And yeah, I'll give two I'll give two answers to that. Yeah. My very first company was when I was in high school. I have a brother who is kind of a famous game programmer. Um, how many people here know the game Frogger? So yeah, so my brother created Frogger for the Atari platform. And um, I think he sold 4 million copies in the first year. This is back in like the 80s. And I was inspired by him. I was a musician and I did sound effects programming for him. But kind of on the heels of that, I created a video game called Cupid. I licensed to a company called Games by Apollo. They paid me 25 grand plus a dollar royalty per game. But then they went out of business. Mm -hmm. And then I got really busy with other things. I was playing in a bunch of bands uh, and I never got around to relicensing to another company or to try to self publish it. But I didn't make much money, but for a high school kid in Boston, that was an enormous amount of money. Um, my first real company, sort of adult company, was coming out of Interleaf, which is a document management company. I did one year detour to a startup called Netcentric, a startup by a guy named Sean O'Sullivan. I acted as CTO there. Uh, that imploded, so I learned a lot about what works, what doesn't work. 
And then right after that, I created something called Boss and Light, mm -hmm. which was an e-commerce startup. I ended up selling to Intuit, where I served as VP Technology and worked for Intuit for four years. And that was incredibly formative part of my career, learning about customer support and market research and branding. Yeah. And, and that's, I'm assuming, what led you to form Kayak and build that business. And yeah, Kayak came right after that, after Boss and Light. I left Intuit. Uh, my mom had passed away, and I left into it to take care of my dad, who had Alzheimer's. Um, and then after my dad passed away, I became an EIR for Greylock, mm -hmm. a top VC firm here and in the West Coast. But then one day was called to visit someone at General Catalyst uh, to give them an uh, opinion about a company that they wanted my advice on. And just by chance, I ended up meeting another guy who was there pitching a company. Mm -hmm. And one of the venture partners put the two of us together and said, oh, you, you know, this is Steve, one of the founders of Orbitz, wants your travel company. This is Paul, good tech guy in Boston area. And we went downstairs for drinks. And within an hour, we each put a million dollars in and created the company as equal co-founders, like within an hour of our first meeting. Wow. Yeah, and that led to a 10-year collaboration. Steve's actually still at Kayak. We sold it to Booking.com. Um, 10 years ago, he's still there, but um, we're still very good friends. Yeah. But I left right after the sale. Yeah. yeah. And, and so you have no more involvement in the company or except for probably... Unofficial. I mean, I use yeah. the product all the time, so I'm probably the number one critic of Kayak. Mm -hmm. I could give you... <laughs> if we had more time, I could tell all the things I hate about Kayak. <laughs> but every time I use it, um, I send Steve bug reports yeah. and screenshots and drawings saying, you got to move this or fix this and make that faster. Wow. wow. Yeah. Um, so... Can you talk about so 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 at Kayak you were um, in your role as leading the company? Um, can you talk about some of the major challenges you faced in in that role? And it sounds like so it sounds like you come from a, a technical background, but you also um, seem to have the administrative stuff down as well. And the uh, I mean, the some of the administrative. And, my trick on the administrator is I'm not very good at following process. Uh -huh. I'm terrible at finance. I have a terrible memory. Um, but the way I make up for that is one, just be honest about it, yeah. but two, recruit people around me who are phenomenal at that skill, sort of COO type people. And so we have that at Kayak. There's a guy named Paul Schwenk who is SVP of engineering and operations, and he was really good with all that stuff. Um, at Kayak, my day job was running the design team. I had no product managers for the first five years. I was, my title was CTO and president, but I was really the first product manager for the first five years. And I hired three designers who sat around me. But in addition to design and, and keep and with a huge focus on speed, um, I probably more than that, the thing that led to Kayak's success was the amount of time I put into recruiting. Mm -hmm. And I read every book and every blog and talked to everyone about it to learn how to get better. We had a recruiting task with the team, how to become better recruiters. I made a lot of mistakes, but Ultimately, I just worked really, really hard at it. I think that um, I probably get too much credit for Kayak. I almost think that anyone could have had the same outcome if they had the team I had. Interesting. Yeah. Right. But you were instrumental in identifying and pinging out that team. I did right? recruit yeah. that team, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you do deserve the credit. Yeah. Um, and so I'm sure you perfected that to a science and you utilize that those same processes today to identify talent, to bring in your team and to recruit it. And have you outsourced that at all and shared that with any other uh, founders or, or companies? Yeah, I, I'm very happy to talk about recruiting. Um, I work with two recruiters right now who help me, but I do a lot of the work that recruiters do. Like for example, I would never let a recruiter negotiate a candidate mm -hmm. on my behalf because I want to get that direct experience. Of like, what is it like to talk business terms with someone? Right. Um, and they will send me, I'll tell them what I'm looking for. They'll send me candidates. I'll approve them. And then many times I'll be as a more successful than a recruiter with first reach out. So I just, a lot of times do first reach out. But the main thing with recruiting is you just have to do it all the time, like 24 seven. I hope by the end of this meeting, I will have hired someone in this room. Um, I'm always <laughs> recruiting. And the trick about recruiting is when you find someone who's like sparkles, and just like has the energy, just do whatever it takes to work with them, even if you don't have a job for them. Right. Like find some side hustle to work with them on because our careers are defined by the people we spend time with. I mean, there's, there's a saying that each of us are the average of the five people we spend the most amount of time with. Mm -hmm. And you can think about that in your personal life. Like, you know, if you want to get in shape, hang out with people who run, right. yeah. um, don't hang out with drinkers. If you want to build a successful company, hang out with people who build successful companies. 
And recruiting is a lot of just constantly on the hunt. And when you find great people, find a way to work with them. That's great. That's great. Uh, sage advice. I think we could probably apply that into many different aspects of life. Yeah. Um, so you, you do so much. How do you, how do you deal with the stress uh, associated with all the work that you do? Yeah, so I'm launching, I'm working on five or six companies right now, three to be launched in the next three months. I have four nonprofits. I'm on eight nonprofit boards. I frequently guest lecture at local universities. Um, I have very little stress. I think I sleep eight to nine hours every night. Um, I guess I attribute many things to, to, to me learning how to live a prolific life without stress. One of them is I studied Buddhism for like the last 10 years at Cambridge Insight Meditation Center on Thursday nights. My teacher's name is Madeline Klein. Mm -hmm. And Buddhism is this is belief that suffering is universal. Mm -hmm. And through studying the works of Buddha, we learn how to alleviate suffering in ourselves, our family, our friends, and the world. And suffering is defined as attachment. Mm -hmm. Where you attach to the world, you want the world to exist one way, but the world is a different way. And you just have this anxiety and this stress. And so Buddhism talks about radical acceptance. There's also something called the serenity prayer, which goes, um, may God give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And I'm a huge believer in the serenity prayer. And one of the things you need to learn to decrease stress in your life is get really, really good at forgiveness. So when someone makes a mistake, you need to learn how to forgive them instantly. And if they hurt you, you know, don't put yourself in a position to get hurt again by that person. But um, there's a saying in Buddhism that being angry at another person yeah. is like drinking poison and expecting them to die. Yeah. And when we realize that stress and anger is inward focused violence, I think those things can be a choice. You can decide not to do it. I know that sounds easy, but yeah. I've worked on it for years and it's yeah. really helped me. Well, it's shocking to hear that come from a CEO, though, right? You know, to 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 employ forgiveness, um, given the fact that you're building a business and you're, you know, uh, the goal is to make that a successful, profitable business. But if you have employees making mistakes constantly, I, I'm sure you're not forgiving them all. Um, maybe there's a certain level of forgiveness you get to, but how do you how do you work through that? I believe um, when I recruit people mm -hmm. to join one of my companies. Many times I'll hire them before we talk about salary. Yeah. Like I'll sit at someone and say, Damon, what do you think? You know, yeah. when can you start? Right. And you'll say, Well, should we talk about salary? I'm like, yeah, 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 there'll be a salary. Don't worry about that. But if you think about like you could clearly go anywhere you want. Yeah. If you look at all the opportunities in front of you, do you agree that this little company is the one you'd get up early in the morning, you'd drive a little faster, work? Mm -hmm. Like do you are you excited about this team you just met? Yeah. And if you are excited about this opportunity, you can visualize yourself changing this company. Mm -hmm. Um, in addition with salary and a title and all that stuff, there's also a psychological contract between the founder and the new team member where I promise you two things and you promise me two things. The two things I promise you are, one, I promise you'll have more fun mm -hmm. at this company than any place you've ever worked. And I don't mean fun like dancing on tables, although that's encouraged. I mean fun in that when you have an idea, you get to try it. Mm -hmm. And there's no stress around you. You know, a lot of work is not fun because there's a lot of stress in our jobs. But if you have a leader who's obsessed with identifying and removing things that cause stress, yeah. it can lead to something where people feel empowered and, and feel fun. Um, second thing I promise is faster skill, skill acceleration, mm -hmm. faster than other jobs. And the two things I ask people to promise me, if you were joining one of my companies, let's say as a product manager, mm -hmm. you have to say, I'll be the best product manager in the US. Yeah. Belichick says, do your job. Like people have to have that hunger right. to be the best at what they do. And then they have to promise to be an energy amplifier, which is to, ex to help accentuate and improve and motivate the people around them. And the secret is if people do their two things, my two things are easy. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. Um, so I could ask a lot more questions, but I definitely want to open it up to our friends online and anyone in the room. Um, if not, I still have many questions for you. But um, Great. Now, we, we've got questions online already, but I'd like to start in the room because you guys showed up. So we'll start right here. So if you can just present yourself and then ask your question. Hi, Paul. Uh, good morning. So huge fan. A uh, question about, so I'm a healthcare startup entrepreneur, also background in software development. So the question is around, if you were fleshing out a new idea in healthcare, how do you think about uh, 
what 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 what's your meta strategy for uh, thinking whether figuring out whether it has legs or not? So this comp uh, so real briefly, it has a clinician component, the patient component. So it all has to be HIPAA compliant, and then you may have to deal with uh, either private practices or large healthcare systems. Uh, bootstrapped small good luck that sounds really hard that sounds a lot harder than the stuff i work on i work on much simpler problems no i think one way to look at if you're trying to figure out is this going to work you need to look at why do companies fail and there's really two reasons that tech companies fail either there's a founder implosion and a toxic culture which unfortunately happens all too often and people just like hate each other and it becomes an uncomfortable place there's a lot of turnover uh, and as a founder you need to learn how not to do that and you need to invest a lot of time in learning to be good, to make a good culture where people thrive and feel great about working there and there's little turnover. Um, the second thing is the reason tech companies fail is not because they built bad tech. Like it's not that hard to build an iPhone app these days or build a you know web website. Um, it's because they built great software for a problem that people don't care about. And so more important than, than solution validation is problem validation. Like the problem you're attempting to solve, how big a problem is it? Like, are you sure? How many people have it? A lot of uh, founders fall so in love with their products that they stop looking at the problem and they become numb to feedback where people say, that'd be nice, but not like, please, can I pay you money today? So I'd spend a lot of time like valuing the problem, see how big is it? And don't, there's a positive confirmation bias where one person says something that, yeah, I hate that. And obviously you get all excited. And then you spend five years of life raising millions of dollars, shut down the company five years later when you realize that not enough people are willing to pay for it. So I'd spend time on problem validation and then be a good recruiter because, you know, like at Kayak, I got this great team. The company built itself. It could have, I think could have built itself without me. If you're a good recruiter, um, your job's going to be way easier and way more fun. Thank you. Hi, I'm Javed Rahman, software background. Um, if someone brings you a good idea, would you take it and then make it part of your portfolio? At BVS, Boston Venture Studio, right now we're not soliciting outside ideas. What we do when someone comes with an outside idea is we give them free advice. Uh, and we don't ask for equity or anything. We just say happy to give advice and feedback on it. And we'll make introductions for people. But we have not yet taken an outside idea and incorporated it. It could happen if it came with the founder. Um, I think ideas are worth less than zero, ideas in their own. A lot of people come to me and say, I have this great idea, a billion dollar idea, and I'll give you half the company if you execute it. I'm like, okay, so you're going to pitch me an idea and then expect to get 50% of a billion dollar company just by having the idea. That's not the real world. Uh, but if someone comes with a team and is a founder, you know, maybe I'll end up investing. Um, but yeah, that, those are my thoughts. So but the website's bvs.net and there's, a, there's an email link on there if you want to drop an email. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Allison. I am the founder of Just Add Flights. And I just had an, a question as you mentioned kind of building Kayak and you had an amazing team that you worked with. It sounds like you had quite a bit of experience in the past in the entrepreneurial you know, community and growing your name and, and having kind of that name recognition. For people who might not have that name yet, what's, you know, other than networking at these amazing events and things like that, but what is a really great way to kind of bring in talent and without that name that kind of comes with it. Yeah. So the beginning, the beginning of my career, like when I built the e-commerce company, that was my first real company. So I couldn't go to people and say, I built a billion dollar company, come help me, help me build the next one. But what I could say is I've done these things, things that I had done in my career, like as a programmer, and here's my ideas for the new company. And I also, I, do lead with culture, actually. I'll say I want to build the best jobs of people's careers, and I'm really serious about it. And I want the first five hires to participate with me in building that. Um, the first five hires get you the next 50 hires, which gets you the next 500 hires. So you have to put particular attention on who those first five are. You want all of them to be storytellers, charismatic recruiters. Um, and the best way to get people to believe you, it's really two things to recruit people. 
One is you need a track record when you say you're going to do something that you do it. And that doesn't mean build billion dollar companies. It could be anything, but people say, see that I said, I'm going to do this thing and I did it and this thing and this thing and this thing. And those problems get progressively bigger as your career evolves. And the second is be a good storyteller and the storytelling thing you can, you know, with jobs, you used to call it the reality, the reality distortion field, a good storyteller can paint a vision for someone where they see themselves at a company, get really excited about it, and will join that company beyond logic because they like the founder and they like the shared mission that they would work on with the founder. So I think it's those two things. Hi, uh, my name is Ayelet, and I'm f a founder in the area of online scam detection. Um, I briefly heard that you're a musician in your background, and I, I don't think you mentioned the, the background in computer science, but I looked it up. And my question connects to the storytelling and talking about bringing your whole self to work. Uh, how much does your extracurriculum activity, so being a musician, and you talked about the improv, and you talked about the meditation, how does that impact your ability to tell a story? beyond your background in computer science? I think it does. I think the most interesting, I don't think, I, I don't think I'm that interesting, but I have a story about me trying to prove to someone that I'm not interesting, but I don't think I'm that interesting, but I do have a lot of different thing, parts of my life. And I, I try to recruit people who have a lot of parts of their life. Um, I once, a few years ago, I became an Uber driver, just for the fun of it. It's sort of a longer story, but one day I was driving and there was this 12 year old girl in the back seat from China. And I always like talking to my passengers and I have a notebook with one sentence from every passenger. And I asked her why, you know, I said, do you live in Boston? She said, no, I'm visiting with my mom and my aunt who are both in the car with her. And I said, why uh, Boston? She said, well, I'm looking for high school here because my belief is if I go to high school in Boston, it'll increase my chance of getting into MIT. And I really want to get into MIT. And I thought it was amazing for a 12 year old girl in China. And I said, well, I teach, I'm on the faculty at MIT. And she said, I don't believe you. You wouldn't be driving for Uber if you're in the faculty at MIT. I'm like, well, <laughs> there's a lot of parts to my life, you know, and like, she didn't believe me. But I do like, I hired a guy once named Ted Patton because he had an Olympic medal. And when I found that out, I almost like just want to hire him immediately on the spot. Not that I needed him to do rowing for my company, but someone who can perform in one discipline, I think can often perform at the other because it's all mental and attitude. Um, so I look, I do look for diverse experience. I look for people of experiences that I don't, that I can learn from. And I think teams work best when we're all learning from each other. Great answers. We've got more questions in the audience. Rod, your name and. Hi, Julie Smith. I work with entrepreneurship for all and thank you. Yeah. Gail Goodman. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Gail Goodman. And I guess, you know, as, a, as an organization focused on supporting under typically underrepresented entrepreneurs, I'm curious to get your thoughts and advice specifically for women, BIPOC immigrants who may not have the same opportunities to uh, become a successful business. I think, you know, my comments about tech companies, I talk a lot about storytelling and recruiting. That's true if you want to build a roofing company. Like if you want to build the best roofing company in Boston, you want the best crew in Boston and you want it that when you're installing a roof, that that homeowner not only gets a good product at a good price and done really well, but that when they interact with their crew, they're like, whoa, this, this is like a great company. Like they dress well, they're polite, they have they brand on their shirt, nice shirts. Um, and I think storytelling will get you those people Recruiting will get you those people. And whether you run a restaurant, a daycare, you know, whatever it is, try to get the most magical team you can is one thing I would coach people because it's through those people that one, you're going to have the most fun, but two, you'll create this magical company. I have this belief that magical teams build magical products and magical products build good P&Ls. Wonderful. We've got another one back here. Please present yourself. Good morning. My name is Henry Breyer. I'm a strategic communicator, writer, editor, speech writer. Um, Mr. English, I was wondering if you'll please talk a little bit about um, what went into the uh, the King Memorial, how long it took, and other um, related uh, information, please. Yeah, so I, I started 
it was originally called King Boss, and now it's called Embrace Boss. And I started it in September of 2017 when I became very concerned about the nationalist and racist rhetoric going across the country at that point in 2016. And I became, I became scared, like for the country, about the rhetoric. It was really scary. And I was visiting the MLK Memorial in San Francisco, which I recommend anyone who goes to San Francisco, please take time to visit it. It's across from MoMA, from SF MoMA. Um, and I was just incredibly inspired with how beautiful it is. And I knew that Martin and Coretta had roots in Boston. They met here. She went to New England Conservatory. He went to BU. There were students. The love story began here. Their professional lives began here. And I said, why doesn't Boston do something like of a bigger scale to show that their roots, professional roots and their love story started here? I was incredibly naive at the time, though. I thought it was going to take me a year to build it. It took me five and a half years. Um, I first found Reverend Liz Walker as my co-founder. She was not only a well-known newscaster in Boston during the early part of her career, but she became, I think she got a PhD at Harvard Divinity and then was a minister and pastor at Roxbury Presbyterian Church. And she and I went out into the community. We held 14 community meetings around the city asking people, if we want to do a major new nonprofit commemorating Martin and Coretta, what else do you want us to do? We want a memorial, but like, what else should we do? And, and what do you want us to represent? We learned a lot by listening. But then we had to, there was a whole international design competition, which I could talk about. But then we had to get it approved. And it was amazing. I mean, someday I should talk publicly about the barriers we face. But the fact that it took us five and a half years, and I'm a very determined person, like when I want to do something. But we had to get it passed, the Boston Landmark Commission, which interesting, in a city that's minority majority, it's interesting that 16 of the 17 members are white. Like, I don't understand that exactly. Um, we had to get past the uh, Friends of the Public Garden, which are the neighbors of Boston Common, which are very wealthy. We had to get past the Boston Arts Commission. They're like just more and more agencies. And I don't want to name names, but a lot of people tried to stop it. They said it's too big, it's too modern, it's too abstract. It doesn't represent the Boston Common. Uh, but we got we got it done. It just took me a lot longer than I thought it would. I'm going to take one. I'll take one from online, and then we'll go back to the room. Uh, so somebody has a going back to business. Are there any other projects you're currently working on that are incorporating AI? Yeah, that's for you, Paul. That's for you, Paul. So, 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 so just any projects that you're working on that are incorporating AI? That I'm working on. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I'm launching three companies in the next three months. One of them is a competitor to Evite and Paperless Post called Etel, E-T-E-L-L. -L. There's a beta out there now, but we'll be launching in a month. I have a dating app. When I sold my company, Lola Travel, to Capital One, I kept the name. So I'm repurposing that name via dating app. It's Lola.com. And that's using more machine learning than AI, but it's using some AI techniques to do matching. There's two other things about this app that are very different from any other dating app. And then the third app that we're launching, really, it's a, it's a massive relaunch. It's called Deets, like show me the Deets, it's Deets.com. And we're launching um, city guides so that you can have um, your guide to Miami or wherever. And that's generated by scraping information we know about you from Instagram and other places. We create the guide using generative AI, and then we'll let you edit the guide. And then we give you commissions about anything sold off of your guide. So that is using generative AI to build these really beautiful, visually designed guides that are personalized to you, both by extrapolating stuff that you've dropped elsewhere and letting you personalize it. Um, there's one more AI project we're working on that's really in the prototype stage, which is we're building a bot generator to let anyone create a bot of themselves. And there's three use cases, celebrity backpack legacy. Celebrity is every celebrity should have one-on-one -on -one relationships with their fans. You can only do that through a bot uh, by email, text, phone call, FaceTime with the bot of uh, Kanye West, whoever you want to talk to. Uh, the second is backpack. If you go offline for a week and you want your bot answering your Slack messages, your emails. And the third is legacy, which is we all should be building bots of our parents so our kids can talk to them in 30 or 40 years. Um, that project is in the R&D stage, and you can't just take like GPT-4 off the shelf and make it work. There's a lot of 
for personalization a lot for performance and scale and cost. And I've been working on that one about six months. I mean, it doesn't work good enough yet, but that's the last one that we're working on that's AI focused. Wow, that's a lot of great, exciting projects you've got going on right there. Uh, so another uh, question in the room. Has he spoken to the EMI? Uh, good morning. Thank you so much for, for being here. Um, my name's Susan Munter. I own an advertising agency, Branding Band. We work exclusively with startup organizations. As people start to think about their image and presenting themselves, it suddenly dawns on them that they should be paying attention to DE&I. And I always get the question, we, we, want, we know this is important. How, how do we make this happen? How do we do this? And I'm curious, given how, that you've been through so many stages with so many companies, how you've done it. For diversity and inclusion specifically? Diversity and inclusion, yeah. yes. Yeah, I mean, I think diverse teams think better, they're more fun. And not just diverse in terms of racial agenda, but diverse in terms of like, hire someone with an Olympic medal, hire someone that's low income, hire someone that is from a country that you don't know, you've never met anyone before, have racial diversity, gender diversity. You want diversity in many axes as possible. On the racial diversity, you know, locally, I, there's a couple of nonprofits I like a lot. I like hack diversity and I like resilient coders. Those are great organizations. I think everyone should, every company should back and invest in. Um, I think you need, to look harder. Um, I have one job opening right now that we're trying to find um, a more diverse candidate than this part of my team has right now. And the recruiters, I'm driving the recruiters crazy because I'm looking for something difficult to find. But I basically said, I will interview anyone who meets my spec. And I've been interviewing dozens and dozens and dozens of people. But I'm just committed that I want this candidate to have particular background. I'm just going to work really hard until I find it. Um, it's also important to have diverse te interview teams because if you're trying to hire a person of color and all they meet is like eight white guys in the interview process, subconsciously they're not going to visualize themselves at your company. Um, if you're trying to hire a female engineer and all she meets is male engineers, subconsciously, consciously, she's not going to visualize herself at your company. So it starts with the beginning team, try to make it diverse, have the recruiting team, Recruiting interview team be diverse and just um, work at it. It's hard, but the results you get can be really fun. So it sounds like holding out and presenting an organization where people can reflect themselves, see themselves. Yeah. Thank you. Sticking with the room. Welcome and present yourself. And Thank you. Hi, my name is Christina Crowley. Could you please talk a little bit about your nonprofits? The ones I've started, I'll do this quickly. I run a school system in Haiti called Summits Education. I've been going to Haiti for 20 years. First one in 2003. We have 40 schools, 350 teachers, and 10,000 students. Some people would ask me, why bother teaching children of illiterate subsistence farmers how to read and write and how to do critical thinking because these kids are going to become farmers. And I'm thinking maybe a bunch of them will be farmers, but I'd rather have literate critical thinking farmers than illiterate farmers. And I think that reading and writing is like a human right and everyone around the world should, should learn that. So we're doing that just to invest in the community. It's incredibly fun. I love the country. A lot of challenges there these days, but, um, I like challenges and it's, it's good to take on projects that are hard. Um, Embrace Boston, we already talked about. We've raised $35 million of racial justice programs in the US. I run something called the Winter Walk for Homelessness. It's winterwalk.org. We do a walk, a contemplative, just two mile walk. It's usually on the morning of Super Bowl Sunday to make it easy for people to remember when it is. Um, we've done it seven years. We've raised millions of dollars for homeless shelters. We have homeless people give talks to the crowd. Last year we had 4,000 4, walkers. This year we're going to try to take it national and try to do the walk in other northern cities. Um, and we just raise about every year for what we're trying to accomplish with the funds we raise. Mostly my job as a philanthropist is to get out of the way because I think the closer the people are to the work, the better they can do with the money than listen to the donors, think about how we should be doing the money. In fact, there's a, one of my favorite nonprofits called givedirectly.org and they do direct cash transfers to poor people, which sounds 
insane. Like there's a big project done in Canada right now with the homeless population where they give homeless people $7,500 Canadian dollars in cash with no strings attached. And the naysayers were saying like, this is insane. They're going to buy alcohol. They're going to do bad things with this money. But it was done in partnership, I believe, with Give Directly. It's a very, they have a lot of academic rigor. Uh, the budget in this city in Canada was $15,000 per year per homeless person, what they were spending. So is it somehow some visionary person, let's just try it. And it turns out that poor people know what they need more than rich people know what poor people need. So I'm very intrigued by nonprofits being as thin as possible, as flat as possible, and get the resource to people who know what they need. Um, I have a nonprofit called the Bipolar Social Club. I'm bipolar. I struggled a lot in my 20s and 30s. And because I've been open about being bipolar, people reach out to me a lot. And I probably have five uh, young men that I've been mentoring the last five years, all in their 20s. And I sort of see myself in them because I know my struggles and why I was in my 20s. One of these young men uh, moved to Kenya and we were working together to um, set up a company there and he ended up killing himself. And um, that touched me greatly. And it made me think that I spent so much of my life doing nonprofit work, but I never did anything personal. So as a result, sort of to honor Jake, I created this thing called the Bipolar Social Club. It's just a hundred members right now, but it's the most amazing. We have an email list, a Discord server. We do Zoom meetings and in-person meetings. It's the most loving community I've ever been a part of. And invariably with a hundred bipolar people, any one day, a lot of them are struggling, but they reach out to each other and they're incredibly raw and vulnerable and helpful to each other. So that's been really inspirational. And then just really quickly, my last nonprofit is I'll be launching something in October called Banned Books USA. Um, I've become horrified with um, DeSantis and Abbott, DeSantis in Florida, Abbott in Texas, and other places in the country to doing things like removing to Tony Morrison from bookshelves. Like, really? Um, it makes no sense. So we're going to be selling banned books below cost, free shipping to communities where books are being banned. And um, that's a major initiative that will be launched in October. Paul, uh, just sticking with that theme for a minute, you're touching on mental health and for founders everywhere, that's such an important issue, taking care of themselves physically and mentally. Uh, can you just talk a little bit more about the importance of mental health, reaching out for help when you need it and what founders should consider as they're going through their journey? Yeah. Um, so if you have a 10 person company, this probably three or four people in your team, they're either struggling with mental health issues themselves or someone in their family. And so as a founder, if you really want to be a holistic founder, you need to understand mental health challenges and you need to understand what your role is as an ally to help the people on your team. Um, the advice I've given people on my teams, one is I'm just open about my struggles. And I think by me being open gives people, they feel safe being open back to me. And the first advice I give to people that are struggling is secrecy is the opposite of healing. If you keep your challenges a secret, no one can help you and you can't evolve. So the first thing I say to people who are struggling with mental health issues is you need to find three people to tell your secret to. One person in your family, one person in your friend group, and one person that you work with. And just very quietly find the right three people and tell them your secret about whatever it is you're struggling with. And what you'll find is people will lean in and they're going to want to help you. Humans in general have a desire for connection and a desire to be valued and to be looked at. And if you simply create a culture where people listen to each other and they try to help each other, that's kind of step one. There's a lot more, but I think that's the first step. That's a great answer. No, thank you for that. Uh, stick, sticking with some mental health issues, founders get a lot of no's. And one question came in on how uh, you get over those no's and particularly your experience with the Embrace Project. When you get a no, how did you get around that? And also, what should founders consider when they're getting those no's? Yeah, I might not be. I'll give you my answer, which might not be the best. I think that 
question might be best asked of a VP of sales because their career is getting no's. Um, for me personally, the way I push through is I make sure that there's a few people saying yes, and then we count on each other. I like companies with two founders, if not three, just to um, be there for each other. And like with the King Boston, then becoming Embrace Boston, Liz Walker, my co-founder, she really wanted this and thought this was important. And so at the end of the day, we'd have a tough meeting with a lot of pushback. And I'd look at Liz and like, are we really doing this? And she'd be like, yeah, we're really doing this. And we just supported each other. And because we wanted it and we became very close friends, part of my commitment to this project was my commitment to her because she had allocated hundreds, probably thousands of hours to the project. And I wanted her to be successful, you know, and she wanted me to be successful. So find some people that want to be on the journey with you and commit to each other. Great answer. And so we're going to go back to the room here. We've got questions online and in the room. Uh, so present yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is uh, Patrick and I'm from Zimbabwe. I head innovation in the financial institution. So, so one of the problems that I have is that um, as we go through the innovation cycle, um, there are certain key performance indicators that we have where we need to have, say, certain products developed by a certain period of time or within a certain period of time. And when management looks at it, they are thinking that, okay, um, there is no product, say, at the end of the first quarter, no product at the end of the second quarter and stuff like that, even though there's a lot of work that has gone through uh, that cycle, maybe uh, problem validation and everything that you mentioned. So what I wanted to find out is um, how do you go about um, when you're setting up a, a startup company and you want to launch it, do you give timelines to it to then say, if it's not launched by this time, we're shelving it? Or do you just let it go through the hoops and everything that it needs to go through for it to get to the full launch? I'm a huge believer in audacious goals and milestones. I don't think anyone, know how to, how, no matter how smart they are, can really predict the future of a company. But... Um, I read an interview with the, with the CEO of NVIDIA yesterday where he talked about how he runs projects at NVIDIA. It was, it was quite inspirational. But I think what we can do at our best is do rapid sequential, which is you have a vision for what you want to do long term. Visions aren't hard. What's hard is predicting when things happen. And um, what you do is you have a vision for the long term, for the culture you're trying to create and the problem you're trying to solve and how lies people how people's lives will be changed if you solve that problem. And then you pick a milestone, and I believe in short milestones. Um, like I like, I gave my team this morning at a call, and I gave them a week to give me a demo of the V2 version of my product. And then really race to that milestone and hopefully get people to crush that milestone. And when they succeed and deliver that thing and short, narrow the focus as much as you can to make it possible to get something done quickly, then celebrate that success and use that success to motivate you and excite you about the next milestone, which is going to be a little bit harder and maybe a little bit broader. But in general, um, I, used to, I designed a class at MIT on um, entrepreneurship. And one lecture I gave was, I, I, I think it was like a three-hour class. And I spent three hours teaching people how to narrow an idea, which is I'd have each of the 30 students pitch me their idea. Each student had to be working on a company to be in the class. And then would spend, I don't know, a good 10 minutes with each person saying, all right, that's a big vision. But what if I told you I'll fund you only if you throw out 95% of your idea? What's the 5% you would keep? Like, what's really the kernel, the core part? And can we just crush that part first and ignore the other 95%? And... Um, I think by narrowing and bringing deadlines in, we can celebrate success along the way and use that to motivate ourselves. Great answer. Uh, we're going to go back to one online. One of the themes of this week has been around failure and how do you get over failure? How do you deal with failure? How do you embrace failure? You've had so many ventures. Can you talk a little bit about what happens when one fails? How do you recover from that? What do you do? Yeah. Um... So this is embarrassing to say, but the companies I was full-time at, I'm six for six, uh, that we had positive outcomes, but 
I've had failures in my part-time projects and some of my successes were not very big successes. They were success, like we sold the company, but um, we didn't get the outcome we wanted. Um, when I don't get the outcome I want, what I try to do is two things. One, I try to figure out what are the positives of that experience that I learned from and that people learn from. Like, let's say you work at a company for four years and didn't have exactly the outcome you wanted. First thing you do is say, what things happened those four years that were good that helps people? that your team can take to their next company and make them stronger at what they do. And hopefully there's an answer to that question. There's something to learn from. And the second thing you need to do is just say, what could have we done better? What could have we anticipated earlier? What could have we done faster to anticipate problems earlier rather than later? And then um, just a commitment to, I'm not going to make those mistakes again with the next company. So I think that's, that's kind of how I look at it. Wise advice. Uh, anyone in the room? We've got a bunch of questions online that we can go to. So one of the questions online uh, goes to ageism. And we've got founders that are very young and we've got founders that are very old and there's discrimination that happens all over the place with everybody everywhere. And how do we deal with that? And what should those founders do, particularly in the realm of ageism? Yeah, I've seen it on both ends. I have, um, <clears throat> I had a woman I hired a few years ago her name is Eliana Berger. I met her when she was 18 years old and a student at Northeastern. I gave a talk there. And she came up afterwards to ask me a question. And I was just really taken aback by her um, clarity and thinking and her confidence. And even though she was just 18, I'm like, there's something special about this kid. So I hired her a couple years later as an intern. And she just crushed it. And she used to, I trained her how to run meetings. I have a particular way that I run meetings and I trained her how I run design meetings. And she took it and flew. But the people in the room with her, I think she was at this point 20 years old. Maybe she was a senior in college at this point. They were, let's say, 40 years old on average. And some of them didn't respect being told what to do by a 20 year old, a 20 year old woman. Maybe there's a gender thing there going on as well. And, um, I think the most senior members of the team just saw how bright she was and just liked her aggressiveness. We had one person on the team who couldn't deal with her and he he's quite rude to her all the time. And I saw a pattern with this person that it wasn't just with this woman. I ended up firing that person, even though he was an extraordinary what he did. But if my if I tell people my commitment is the most fun you've ever had and skill acceleration, yet there's someone who's harassing at work, I'm going to fail my commitment. And I take my commitments very, very seriously. So I had to get rid of that person. Eliana, I will say today, is a VC-backed CEO. She's probably 22 years old. Um, so I try to find examples to break the mold, to make people say, well, maybe young people um, can add value even without experience, and then groom those young people. On the other side, I've hired, I don't think I've yet hired some in their 70s, but I've hired engineers in their 60s. And I like teams like on the ageism thing of age diversity and you can find people in their sixties who are incredibly talented and dynamic and open to new ideas, but also have lots of experience. And then you find young people with hopes and aspirations, but not experience. And if you find the right people, they enjoy learning from each other's perspective. And then they demonstrate, wow, look how well this 18 year old intern is working with this 60 year old engineer. And it sets the tone for the rest of the company to say, this is a cool thing when it happens. Absolutely. Great answer. So we are coming. This has been a great session, both of you. Uh, we are coming towards the end of it here. We've got time for maybe one more quick question. Paul, I was just wondering, uh, so the class that you teach at MIT, I'm not at MIT, but if you were to boil it down to it, the 5% of the takeaway of how you take a big vision and boil it down to that 5%, what would you say the takeaways are? I think it's, um, I'm going to ask people to give the vision and then I'll say, but why are you doing that? And they'll say, I'm doing it for this reason because I think nurses work too hard and they work too many hours to get burnt out. So I want to build a tool that makes it easier for nurses. And you say, but why do you want them to work less hours? Well, why do you want, and just keep asking why, trying to get to the core of the idea, the thing that's really the motivation. Um, and then to say, 
okay, you think you need 10 engineers. If you only have two engineers, what would they work on first? And I'm not saying you can't do the big vision. It's okay to do the big vision. But if you had to deliver something in a week, what would you do in a week? And then in a month, what would you do in a month? And just force them to sequence it. Because again, as I was saying earlier, none of us can really predict the future, how everything's come to, gonna come together, how the market will evolve, technology will evolve, competitors will evolve. But um, when we have our long-term vision, there's a discipline in breaking it into segments that I can implement rapidly. Generally, the startups that win are the ones that get feedback loops, the tightest feedback loops. So I just try to counsel people on finding a way to get that. What, what could you do in a week and what could you do in a month? Great. So we are really cutting it close. We're going to try to fit one more in. Um, hi, Paul. I'll try to keep it brief. My, my name is Peter. My past, um, I've been sort of in the built environment uh, professional for a long time. I'm curious about your thoughts on innovation for like the built environment as it's a big challenge, especially when you went through the Embrace um, project. I'm intimately familiar with some of the struggles. So using things like AR or um, online engagement platforms, would it have, do you think it would have helped in the whole process? Say, so I'm not trying to, can you say more about the question? Yeah, just for like um, the innovations um, that you apply to the built environment, given how big of a challenge it is. For, um, do you think there's a, uh, it would be helpful when you went through that um, process to have like, for example, AR or augmented reality or having other technologies to? I haven't, I have an Oculus um, that was fun for a while and then I got bored. I have enjoyed reading about the Vision Pro, the Apple product. I read the patent applications to try to understand the, the technology more. I'm very excited about that. I don't think, even though I think Apple will leapfrog anyone else in the space with their AR technology, I think Apple's isn't good enough. Um, I think the tech is going to get better. And ultimately, the augmented reality will look like reality. Apple's won't look like reality. It doesn't have the resolution and the speed that you need but it's, it's way better than anything else and things are going to keep getting better. So I can imagine what it'd be like. I want, I actually just, like want the Google glass vision from 10 years ago. It was defective hardware, but I have um, kind of mild face blindness where I'll meet someone at a dinner party and I'll meet them a year later. And I forgot. I don't, I don't remember the face. I'll remember the conversation, but not the face. And I wish I had glasses that when I saw someone, it just showed me where I met them. That'd be, that's like my simple AR that I want. Um, the technology needs to happen. It is going to happen. I can't predict when it'll be, the tech will be good enough to be mass market. As far as use in the design process, I like prototyping. I like saying, if you imagine this future, what might this look like? If you can do that in AR, based on what you're building, that could be very cool. Like 3D printing has been very helpful to people in engineering to see really cheaply what what it, what something might look and feel like. Um, I imagine AI will improve that. Really great session. That's all the time we have today, but Damon, uh, that was wonderful. Paul, that was really incredible.